This is a test. Can you hear us? Can you hear us, people online? Please yes, give a sign. Yes, yes, now it's yes. much bigger. Okay. There was just a bit of noise. Wonderful. Okay. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I yeah. I will tell them that. Uh, yes. Your name is not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just uh, let me. Are you hearing me? Yes, we hear you. We hear you. Okay, very good. You know the name is not uh, is not my name, but uh, I'm yeah. Teresa Ribeiro. Okay, yeah. the RFOM. We, there just... is a problem with my Zoom. Uh, that's the reason why I have to enter yeah. with uh, with one of my colleagues. Okay. Yeah, we understand. And uh, if you want to rename uh, your account, you have to do it yourself. It can't be done from here. I know, I know, I know, but I, I, I couldn't manage. Okay. We tried here, but we couldn't. No, okay. <laughs> but we know you are Teresa Ribeiro. <laughs> okay. Yes, I am. Okay. Even if it's the name is not the appropriate one. We, we manage, we manage. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you and good evening, everybody, to this uh, town hall meeting uh, with the title Regulating Algorithms, what if, if not, and if so, how? So a little bit uh, a riddle, but um, we are here to um, unfold a little bit the, dif the different human rights risks of algorithms, so for freedom of expression, freedom of assembly, non-discrimination, self-determination, privacy, and the right to information. We also want to discuss the responsibility of human rights protection from different stakeholder perspectives and different forms of policy making and regulation, highlighting advantages and disadvantages of each approach. And we want to start elaborating recommendations for how the topic of algorithms impact on human rights should be included in the global digital compact which is one of the topics of or one of the objectives of the internet governance forum here in Addis as such i would like to introduce uh, today's speakers we have with us online uh, teresa rivero oseE representative on freedom of the media uh, she represents an intergovernmental organization we have with us um, Cornelia Kutara. She is uh, from Microsoft Europe. Um, we have with us Ose Ba, uh, the International Cooperation Officer for the Cybersecurity Authority in Ghana. And we have with me here in Addis, Shavna Mochtahiri, Senior Advisor of the International Center for Not-for-Profit Law, ICNL. So welcome everybody also to our small but audience in the room. We have um, said that we will have two rounds of questions to the panelists and if there is time, and I hope there will be time, we can also take some questions from our audience. Let's start with you. I would like to ask you, what risks do you see for human rights coming with the use of algorithms? And, and how do you assess public awareness about the topic of human rights? risks. I, I know that you have a lot to say, but if possible, stay with six to seven minutes. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, uh, at this late session when um, uh, others might be going uh, to enjoy the festivities at the park. Uh, since we're a small group, um, I was wondering um, if uh, you could raise your hand um, uh, how, 
are you familiar with the topic of um, algorithms, uh, AI systems? Uh, is this an, is is this a uh, is this a familiar topic for you already? Let's raise your hand. Okay. How about uh, the intersection of human rights? And uh, how about uh, AI regulation, the issue of AI regulation? Okay, so now we have a sense of uh, where people are and uh, hopefully we can have an interesting conversation um, in the Q&A. Um, so, uh, as uh, was said in the introduction, um, my name is Shabnam Mochtahedi. I am legal advisor for digital rights at ICNL. Um, ICNL, we support uh, enabling uh, uh, legal environment for civic space and civil society around the world. And as uh, digi on the digital rights team, we focus specifically on online civic space uh, and enabling um, environment of how tech um, impacts uh, uh, civic space and civil society uh, writ large. Um, so the question really is, why should civil society care about this topic? Why, why, why is this on ICNL's agenda to begin with? Um, and uh, I would just give three examples to highlight uh, why this uh, topic uh, is important. First, uh, AI systems um, uh, are used for uh, surveillance, and uh, uh, including surveillance of civil society organizations. So understanding um, uh, how algorithms play a role role in that um, and the governance of those uh, algorithms become quite relevant uh, to civil society uh, when they are the targets uh, of surveillance systems. Um, AI systems also uh, are used to suppress or manipulate on online content by uh, uh, platforms. So uh, for civil society working on freedom of expression issues and fundamental human rights and civic space, again, this becomes quite relevant uh, to, to their work. Um, and then uh, AI systems are also used for justice processes or other public services when governments are procuring uh, uh, these uh, systems uh, and using them uh, for uh, governance issues. Uh, it's quite important for civil society to understand and have a voice and participate in, uh, in and understand, have, the, have uh, transparency in place to understand, uh, understand these systems um, so that they can play their uh, watchdog role. Uh, so what are the main risks. Um, I categorize the risks uh, twofold. Um, first is the risks with uh, the development of AI, so the upstream uh, risks um, posed by AI systems, um, and then the risks of uh, adoption and use of AI. Um, so those are the downstream risks. Um, and they're interrelated, but uh, I think it's helpful to separate them out uh, uh, to understand uh, kind of the specific uh, issues at play. So what are these risks, as, as was asked? Um, privacy rights um, specifically. So when it comes to the development of, of algorithms, um, data and sometimes personal data and sensitive data might be used uh, to uh, develop uh, these algorithms uh, and sometimes uh, without the consent of, uh, of the parties um, uh, whose, whose da data are being used. Um, and so uh, uh, giving more control over uh, and more uh, uh, privacy rights protections for users becomes quite, uh, quite relevant for uh, the development. On the use side, again, like I said, um, uh, privacy rights are violated when, some, when these systems are used uh, to surveil and monitor um, outside of uh, uh, legal protections of due process uh, and 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 so forth, human rights law. Um, so uh, those uh, are are two risks on 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 either side of the uh, the development and the and the, and the use. Um, on uh, Another area of risks um, when it comes to algorithms is bias and um, specifically the right to be free from discrimination. Uh, so uh, on, the, uh, on that end, uh, there is uh, a risk of how the uh, systems are developed in a way um, using data uh, that might not be representative of the communities um, that uh, it's going to be, uh, that will be impacted by, uh, by the algorithm um, or the AI system and uh, and 
also on the development side or on the youth side, uh, it might be used to perpetuate um, existing inequalities because if the data that was used um, uh, reflects historical uh, inequalities in a country uh, or in society as a whole uh, uh, and, uh, and that system is then used uh, uh, based on that data, uh, then it will perpetuate uh, uh, those historical inequalities. So um, uh, again, uh, interrelated, but uh, uh, different uh, uh, impacts based on uh, the, the development and then the uh, uh, downstream use of AI. Um, and third, access to justice um, and redress. Uh, so uh, the lack of transparency into how these algorithms have been developed, um, and as you get more complicated AI systems uh, using deep learning, uh, uh, there's, there's a question of, uh, you know, the black box explainability of, of the system itself. Um, and so if those uh, systems are then used um, and then cause a harm to an individual, um, how will the individual seek redress um, if they do not understand how the system works? Um, and so uh, including more transparency both in the, in the development um, and, uh, and the use of uh, AI systems becomes quite relevant. Uh, so really, uh, uh, I that I hope frames uh, this discussion a little bit because the question for regulation, uh, if so and how, is um, about tackling um, uh, uh, the, how to mitigate uh, or prevent these risks and at what stage uh, are the reg regulatory interventions going to be put in place. For example, should they be put in place uh, for the downstream risks uh, or the upstream risks, or both, and uh, and so that's the question really for for regulators. And uh, again, ICNL um, believes strongly that civil society should have a strong voice in um, in uh, the as as regulation is developed because uh, uh, their their organizations um, and their constituents uh, will be impacted by by these systems and and how they're regulated. Thank you. Thank you, Shabnam, uh, for that very useful piece of analysis of, of uh, both the risks and then the, let's say, the entry points for policymakers. With that, I would like to turn to you, uh, Teresa, um, and you speak for those who want to protect human rights. What can and should policymakers do to achieve this goal in the face of, and that's another issue that we have to tackle, the rapidly changing technologies. So the, the policymakers tend to be always a little bit behind. And in that regard, can you please uh, present some of the results of uh, the OSCE uh, Representative on Freedom of the Media Policy uh, Manual that you've recently issued and describe its intended use? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for uh, having me today. It's a pity that I cannot join you. Uh, in presence, but in any case, it's uh, um, it's really it's really a, a good opportunity to present the work we have been doing uh, regarding the impact uh, of AI on uh, media freedom. Um, and I would like to start by saying that uh, uh, new technologies they bring about uh, a transformative moment in time, and with many with many benefits, including for the free flow of information. And I think it's very important to, uh, uh, to underline uh, the benefits and not to demonize uh, um, artificial intelligence. It's much more the way uh, we will be able to regulate it. Uh, it. It will be much more the way uh, we will be able to use it. But at the same time, uh, we know that there are serious human rights concerns such as surveillance, uh, cyber crimes, or the spread of disinformation uh, that, of course, uh, has, have an important impact uh, in the way we seek, receive, and impart uh, information. Um, this uh, also drastically changed the media as we know it. Uh, so it's very, very important uh, not only to address uh, the, so uh, the societal harms of rapidly changing technologies, but also consider ways to harness uh, it for fulfilling the media's democratic role, going back to 
taking advantage of, uh, of the benefits of AI. First and foremost, uh, states have the positive obligation to guarantee the exercise of fundamental rights like freedom of expression. Political will on the side of state authorities uh, is, uh, of course, a precondition for a meaningful uh, engagement to support and strengthen national and international safeguards for freedom of expression and media freedom, also um, in which uh, respects regulating the use of new uh, technologies like uh, AI in its use uh, to shape uh, information. The sad reality, however, is that the political will to protect media, uh, as we all know, uh, is being traded in for hostility against the media in many parts of the world. Uh, we, unfortunately, uh, we are all quite aware of this. Uh, in times like this, it's not, uh, it's not only expedient, but, but it's really necessary to discuss and to strategize around a large number of emerging challenges brought by new technologies, uh, which uh, of course are growing by scale and complexity. And this brings me to the OSC policy manual on AI and freedom of expression. Uh, first of all, it is the combination of over two years of research and contribution of more than 120 of the most renowned experts, scholars, practitioners working in the media, in the field of media freedom, human rights, technology, but also security. As you know, um, OSCE is uh, uh, the largest uh, regional, uh, regional organization on security. Uh, the policy manual and our experts, they have focused on four key areas where the use of uh, AI uh, can be, uh, can have a, 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 a negative impact for media freedom uh, and also for security. First is the use uh, of AI in content moderation uh, with a particular focus on dealing with illegal content and security, uh, uh, security threats online. The second area of focus is on moderating content that may be legal yet harmful, such as hate speech. The third area of focus is on the use of AI in content curation and how this impacts media pluralism. And the fourth and the last one is its ne nexus to targeted advertising and surveillance cap capitalism. So all the recommendations provided in the manual are aimed at states who should put human rights at the core of all regulatory frameworks. And I think this is the most important. We call for such initiatives to be um, evidence-based, and built on uh, inclusive processes. Uh, the key recommendations um, that are provided by the manual uh, encompass and spell out in more detail uh, the principles of transparency, accountability, and public oversight. Without those, we cannot have freedom of expression in the digital age. And I would say that uh, in a nutshell, this is what the policy, our policy manual uh, is about, and this is, I think, uh, a great contribution uh, to the discussions around uh, AI. Thank you very much. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, I would li like uh, now to invite uh, Cornelia Kutter from Microsoft to add her perspective, which is the private sector's perspective uh, to this uh, to this field. Um, Microsoft has been very active in uh, IDF and other multilateral and multi-stakeholder fora to present views. But I would like to ask you, what is what is the view here on the risk of algorithms affecting human rights online? And which role can human rights assessments of algorithms play? And how does Microsoft approach this in its own operations? <laughs> Thank you very much. And um, uh, 
Uh, first of all, thanks thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm also equally uh, like to uh, very sorry not to be there in person. Um, I want to first um, maybe say one word about the abilities of algorithms because we, we usually look and 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 this is important because it, it it's not it, you always have to look at this very holistically we're looking at the algorithms and how they perpetuate biases and uh, by doing so um uh, are increased risks for uh fundamental rights um but what we also see is that by using data analytics and and, and algorithm, we can actually uncover biases that exist. So to give you just an example, in Microsoft, we have a researcher that is um, looking at clinicians' data sets and uh, has by using um, those data sets and, and building models uh, unbi uh, uncovered and a number of different biases that exist where we can act upon those um, and, and, and improve um, the healthcare for more people, be more inclusive. Um, I think it's important to always look at all perspectives uh, on, on these issues. Now, um, I think there is, it, it is it is very clear where there is no governance and no processes in place uh creating and ensuring that um the models and ai systems that are deployed uh where they have an impact on important life decisions of people uh, on safety uh physical and psychological harm or specific fundamental rights these there will be um a broader risk of of infringing human rights, um, and so uh, I think that is what regulators have been trying to approach by a number of um, legislative proposals um, in Europe. Uh, that's where I where I my my focus lies. Of course, the AI Act and then also the Convention. I think the Council of Europe is is an interesting. Um, um, organization as well that that is is approaching uh, fundamental rights much more specific eventually in in trying to to find ways in in minimizing the risks of infringements of human rights. What is important is there is there has to be an understanding of the processes that are really important. Um, that there is no not one size fits all solutions. Um, there is no such thing as error free data. Um, data in itself, in the collection, um, in 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 the curation of the data, there there's risks in how how um, fundamental rights can be potentially affected. Um, we, we see this, for example, of course, something that is discussed outside of the specific AI uh, uh, regulation is currently in the making, also in, in other laws like the Digital Services Act that is more specifically looking at content and how content recommended to users and potential risks associated with this and the lack of awareness um and and i think the 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 list uh, is can go on and on so um the private sector i think is uh increasingly aware of it um either because they have understood that um as a business goal being inclusive ethical is the right solution because you're reaching more people or because they're starting to see that if they don't do this because they understand the business value in doing it right then regulation is also coming so there's a couple of different motivations eventually in in doing the right thing in microsoft um 
we've been starting very early on um, to develop the ethical principles, very similar to many other organizations, enterprises across the world and civil society, and have since then basically um, um, operationalized those ethical principles. And we had a number of learnings by doing this, uh, one of which is that um, you need to fill out the specific objectives that you have, the certain requirements to, that you're putting forward in 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 that process um and so when you think through uh these principles that are set out like transparency or accountability underneath you're you're demonstrating you're telling the engineering groups and sales organizations what your objectives are to give you to give you one example um within our standard that we have now developed that precisely um, spells out for each of these principles um, the, the, the objectives that we are aiming to achieve and then the specific requirements underneath that the specific groups have to follow through. Then you, 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 you're starting to build a governance model and a process that allows to, um, to, to integrate um, these um, checks uh, and balances into, into the system, into the life cycle of an AI system. Um, one or two examples on, on um, accountability uh, underneath uh, objective, we want to make clear, we, we, we need to be clear and we need to have data governance um, in place. Um, we, we need to be transparent to our customers um, and provide them with the necessary information about the abilities of a system, but also about the shortcomings of a system and where they can be used or not, uh, should not be used. Um, important, I think in particular, when you think about fairness or bias, so fairness in order to, to do so, uh, the objective that we are, we are trying to achieve is, to have a, a similar quality of service or equal quality of service for different demographic groups. But that way, it becomes very clear that you need to, for the specific use cases, and make sure Cornelia, do you hear us? I think we lost you. Okay, while, while she's perhaps reconnecting, I go forward to Jose. You are not only um, the, the International Operations Officer from uh, CSA Ghana, but you're also chairing the Digital Equality Working Group within the Freedom Online Coalition. So you're looking at this issue from both, you know, a national legislator perspective, but also from the, um, let's say, from the international coalition perspective. Uh, sorry, Cornelia, we just went on, but I will come back to you in a, in a second round, so, okay. so you can sure. finish your statement. <clears throat> so what do you think, how could regulation help addressing the risks of algorithms, and what should be the elements and tools of regulation? And which role then that would be a second aspect could the Freedom Online Coalition play in, in contributing to this discussion about human rights impacts uh, of algorithms? Well, um, thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jose Baum from the Security Authority of Ghana. Uh, it's, a, it's a body under the Ministry of Communications and Digitalization that is uh, charged with regulating cybersecurity activities in the country. Uh, thank you for thank you to the government of Germany for inviting us to participate on this panel. So um, regulations can help address risks such as data protection issues associated with algorithms. That was that was mentioned earlier. So regulations made to ensure transparency of algorithms can check the type of data collected and go a long way in ensuring that the data is used for a particular or agreed on purpose. So this will be the agreement between um, 
an end user, and then a client. The client could be the tech company or the private sector. And also check how it is secured. Now, algorithms should be regulated to ensure that the information that it collects is used for just what a user requires and just that and for nothing else. So the information should also be secured from hackers and third parties that are always looking for people's information, people's personal data, such as their bank card details, their home addresses, and their social security information. And then we know that sometimes these informations are, are sold on the, on the dark net. Uh, also, regulations can help ensure quality of service or results. So the data and source code used in training, training, training is, is another term for algorithms, that's a more technical term. So the data and source code used in developing algorithms that uh, are meant to provide information such as search engines or provide solutions can be regulated to ensure that it is acquired from expert domain. So what do I mean here? So uh, we should make sure, so for example, we, should, we, we can expect that algorithm, algorithmic code related to health includes expert inputs from medical doctors or scholars in that field, just so, so that we don't just get any results or any service that could be harmful or, or, or provide false information or results. Uh, regulations can also help to ensure a wide range of benefits. See, now, when algorithms are regulated to ensure inclusiveness, especially from its development stage, it ensures that it improves the quality of life of the global citizenry. It, it ensures that everyone, regardless of their race or their gender, enjoy benefits that algorithm-related technologies have to offer. It's, it also ensures that the same technology that is meant to benefit people is not biased or harmful against them. So, so talking about the elements of or, or tools of these regulations, we, we showed expect, these regulations should be right respected. So there's, there's a book entitled uh, The Internet Value Chain and the Digital Economy. Uh, this is written by Professor H. Sama and Wana. And then in this, in this book, he, he notes that in 2018, there were 2,000 people that were wrongly matched as possible criminals in, in the city of Card Cardiff, in the country of Wales. And as a result, uh, it incensed civil liberty groups, and it decided the lack of regulation and human rights concerns. And then there's a, there's a, there's a lawyer from uh, the civil liberties group called Megan Golden. She said that this is just like taking people's DNA or fingerprints without their knowledge or their consent. And, and, and even, however, unlike DNA or fingerprints, there is no specific regulation governing how these policy, or governing how the police should use facial recognitions or manage this, this kind of data that is gathered. So uh, also we, can, we should expect that regulations serve in the best interest of all citizens or the global citizenry and discriminate against none. Uh, and, and MIT students, Joy, Joy Bulamwini, she said that artificial intelligence has a problem with gender and racial bias. And she said this after finding out that an facial analysis software could not detect a dark skinned face until so she had to put on a white mask because it seemed that the system was trained or developed for predominantly light skinned people. So after evaluating some companies, she found out that. The error rates for lighter skinned men were no more than 1%. And then uh, uh, for dark skinned women, the errors soared up to 35%. So AI systems for leading companies have failed to identify even famous faces such as Oprah Winfrey, Michelle Obama, and Serena Williams. So when, when, when technology cannot even identify the faces of these iconic women, then it's, it's time for us to re-examine how these systems are built and who they truly serve. So um, how, how the Freedom Online Coalition can contribute in uh, this discussion. Uh, just, just some background on the FOC for people who are not familiar with it. The Freedom Online Coalition is a, is a government, is, is a group of governments that's currently 34 governments who are committed to working together to support internet freedom and protect fundamental human rights. So we are talking about freedom of expression, we're talking about association, talking about assembly and privacy online. And when necessary, the coalition establishes subordinate entities in the form of task force or a working group. 
And uh, currently, we have uh, the task force. We have, we have we have three task force. Uh, we have the task force on digital equality, the task force on uh, on artificial intelligence and human rights, which is the task force that is championing this 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 panel session. And we also have one working group called the Silicon Valley Working Group. Now, this task force on artificial intelligence aims to promote human rights, respecting AI technologies through the sharing and disseminating information and collaboration or joint initiatives. So the, the task force works to advance the application of the international human rights framework to the, to the global governance of AI through engaging with ongoing international policy discussions and coordinating advocacy across different fora. Uh, there's also the working group of the Silicon Valley, in the Silicon Valley working group, which has the aim of building new forms of cooperation between the FOC and the global technology sector whose products or services potentially impact human rights. So many of these are headquartered in Silicon Valley in the United States of America. And by providing an avenue for continuous private sector engagements with FOC governments, the working group strengthens opportunities for collaboration on the protection of internet freedom and enables tangible outcomes. So the FOC is, is, is playing a significant role around this topic of human rights impacts on algorithms mainly with this, 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 this task force of artificial intelligence and the Silicon Valley Working Group. But nevertheless, I believe that I can do more to update the objectives and aims of these two subordinate entities to focus more directly on algorithms. Better yet, the FOC can still create a whole new subordinate entity to focus on the subject matter with aims and objectives similar to that of the Silicon Valley Working Group, but with focus, but which focuses directly on human rights impact of algorithms. Thank you. Thank you, Ose. Now, Shabnam, we have heard that private sector, national regulators, international organizations are very decided to tackle this human rights risks and solve the problem. So why is it important for civil society to be engaged in these issues? And what are the challenges and opportunities for civil society? Thank you for that uh, question and for um, everyone's comments. It was quite uh, interesting uh, to hear some of those specific examples um, of, of, uh, of how the risks play out. Um, uh, uh, Ose gave uh, some really relevant uh, examples of, of, of bias. Um, so in terms of um, civil society, um, I think that there's been uh, <laughs> Civil society um, in in many parts of the of the world um, are not uh, aware completely of uh, artificial intelligence, and so there needs to be uh, more uh, capacity building uh, in place uh, to train on what AI is, um, how algorithms are developed, uh, what the risks are, and what the impacts can be on uh, on on civil society and, and human rights writ large. Um, so that uh, I think is a first step. I I had talked about some of the some of the uh, rights risks earlier and I, I had meant to say that the, the 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 three that I had mentioned it's certainly not exhaustive there are quite a few others um, but for the sake of time uh, I limited it to three three examples um, so there are uh, a lot of uh, 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 risks involved um, that uh, uh, different civil society organizations depending on uh, what their focus areas are would be interested in, uh, in 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 understanding the intersection with their work um, and then in in terms of the opportunities uh, to to get involved. Um, uh, I think at, at a first level, we're seeing that many countries are uh, putting forward uh, national AI strategies or digitization uh, uh, of public service strategies or uh, different, it, it might be called different things, but essentially putting forth a strategy for how government will support the industry, uh, the tech industry, how go government will adopt uh, uh, these uh, uh, tools internally um, and, uh, and, and uh, how they'll uh, invest in research and, and development. Uh, and so at, at that basic level, when uh, those uh, uh, 
policy initiatives are being formulated, uh, we're seeing that civil society isn't really playing, uh, uh, having a seat at that table. Um, and uh, and we, uh, our position is that uh, they should be involved from the from the very outset um, uh, of of this policy development uh, uh, and, and these initiatives. These. Um, AI, national AI strategies are often also putting forward uh, uh, proposals for regulation. Uh, and, uh, and those proposals aren't necessarily uh, assessing the human rights risks. And that's where civil society can have the voice to, uh, uh, to uh, talk about the, the, the risks and impacts uh, uh, for, for the communities that they, that they represent. Uh, so that's, uh, I think, at a, at a baseline. And then as, uh, as policy are being developed. Um, I think uh, at the EU level, of course, there was quite a lot of uh, civil society input back and forth, um, and and uh, and you know our our, our sister organization uh, ECNL uh, was uh, quite involved uh, in, in that process um, and continues to be. Uh, but uh, we're uh, not seeing necessarily the same level of engagement uh, in other countries. Um, I'll give one example of uh, Brazil where uh, a very um, basic uh, draft framework for AI regulation was put forward um, and uh, with no consultation whatsoever um, and mostly uh, representing the interests of the private sector uh, uh, in Brazil. Um, and so uh, it wasn't really addressing any of the uh, primary risks involved because uh, uh, there was no uh, input uh, from from effective communities. Um, and so Brazilian civil society is quite uh, robust. Um, they uh, they uh, advocated uh, uh, against kind of rushing forward with this very basic uh, uh, framework that was mostly focused on uh, on self-regulation um, and not uh, 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 not hard uh, regulation uh, of AI. And uh, and they were able to get something rolled back and then put in place some sort of uh, a, a more a more robust, although not perfect, uh, uh, process uh, with a commission uh, that had uh, that conducted uh, consultations and uh, and is going through a more thorough process. Hopefully, uh, it hasn't been proposed yet, but drafting some sort of uh, uh, regulation in Brazil, um, and so. Uh, I'll just say that um, there isn't, I think oftentimes uh, uh, civil society in other countries or other governments might look to the EU as like the model. Uh, we saw that with the GDPR, uh, where uh, some countries took uh, the GDPR wholesale. Um, and, and really, uh, I think the conversation needs to be more tailored to the specific context in each country, uh, the, the uh, tech environment within the country, and also um, uh, how they are uh, procuring uh, uh, services from abroad, because uh, oftentimes these uh, algorithms are being developed in other countries, not locally. So. Uh, uh, there, there might be different considerations in place there as well. Uh, so uh, just cautioning against uh, taking a, a, an approach that uh, adopts uh, the EU model uh, wholesale and, and looking to tailoring it to the specific context, to the specific communities, uh, and, uh, and to, the, uh, to, to, to the context in which uh, 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 these algorithms will will be used uh, and, and deployed, and I think that's where uh, civil society can play a really pivotal role. Uh, there are really amazing groups doing great work. I mentioned Brazil as one. Uh, there are many others, um, uh, so I don't want to downplay that. But uh, it's limited, right? There's not that many uh, who that are have it uh, that uh, have the ability to speak to these issues, um, and definitely not representing a uh, whole of society. Uh, and so uh, uh, one of the challenges there is uh, not just ensuring that they have a seat at the table, but that they, they have the ability to contribute to the conversations. Um, uh, and, and, and of course, there's other uh, uh, challenges and, uh, and issues at play, but I think fundamentally that, that's, uh, that covers it. Thank you, Shabnam. I would like to go back to Teresa. You spoke about um, automated decision making as one of the cases of algorithms. Could you elaborate a little bit more about which criteria should automated decision-making 
fulfilled, to be compliant with human rights. And can you perhaps tell a little bit from your experience uh, if private sector or regulatory uh, approaches uh, help uh, define and develop these, um, if one or the other or both help to define these criteria for automated decision making? Thank you. You have to unmute you yourself. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity again to intervene. And um, but let me let me also build a little bit on what we on what we just uh, uh, listen. Hmm? How should we uh, how should we approach this very complex issue of um, of um, of regulating um, artificial intelligence. And I would say that uh, maybe we can look at it uh, from three different dimensions. The first one, uh, as it was mentioned before, it's awareness raising. We need to be sure that uh, uh, the citizens, the individuals are completely aware of the risks uh, linked related to AI, but also uh, the possibilities uh, offered by uh, AI. So yes, I think that uh, a strong intervention uh, of, the, of, the, of civil society is very important, but for that, uh, we need uh, awareness raising. And uh, why is it so important too, is uh, because, uh, you know, the, the business uh, companies, the business companies, they uh, they want to to do business of course but they know that uh, reputational damages um are very important and they cannot risk to have this kind of uh, uh, of uh, reputational damages so it's in their interest uh, to work in the sense of uh, um of respecting uh, what uh, uh, what civil society of what the users uh, really uh, want or should want. But for that, again, the precondition is also awareness raising. And, um, and then the second dimension, I would say, or the second level, it's the process and it's very much, uh, it's very much linked to uh, inclusiveness. Mm? Uh, it's the interest of uh, of the business uh, companies combined with the interest of uh, the individuals, the citizens, together uh, with the uh, the positive obligation of the states uh, to protect human rights. And then the third is the regulation, the, the definition or the regulation of the governance model. And there, yes. Um, we need to uh, be sure uh, that the approach will be based on uh, a values-oriented uh, one. So I would say these are uh, very uh, the three uh, dimensions that I think we have uh, to take into account uh, if we want really to define a governance model that can uh, correspond to the expectations uh, of the public interest and of uh, pluralism. Thank you so much. Uh, now back to Cornelia. When we lost you, you were just speaking about the private sector's motivation to mitigate uh, the risks of human rights violations via algorithms. Perhaps you would like to finish this statement and I would like to follow up with uh, another question on, on this. I mean, regulation means national regulation usually. So what you have to deal with is then different conditions for specific markets for your products. I would like uh, to ask you, are you also, uh, or what what are you expecting for, for global uh, decision making and where could this uh, global policy making and where could this uh, take place? What, what would be your uh, approach to this? Thank you. Yes, and I'm sorry that 
you you must have lost me so early in in my intervention <laughs> because i i was talking a little bit about microsoft's own uh, operations as well in how we over the last couple of years have seek to to sought to to uh, operationalize ethical principles with um if you if you like uh, yeah, you... voluntary standard that we have developed um around accountability fairness transparency safety um privacy and security and um we have learned quite a bit around this uh in in terms of how to think about uh first of all how 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 you have to be specific in what you try to achieve and then also um, in what type of sensitive uses might require additional safeguards to to make sure that you know when there is an impact on people's life when, when there is physical or psychological harms or risks to fundamental rights that you need to look at uh, your process again and, and find mitigation uh, ways either either technical way technical contractual or you might not move forward with the specific application um i i would like before i go to the global or versus national regulation so we have these standards in place and we do hope um we do hope that um the, what we have internally uh developed uh is a good basis for when regulation is applicable to us that uh, we have a good foundation in complying with these new regulations, such as the EU AI Act. Um, maybe just one comment on what was said before, an automated decision making. Um, that's a terminology that we know all well from data protection regulation, um, where the data subject certain Yeah, if you can hear us, perhaps uh, switch off your camera and uh, restart the sentence that you were just uh, about to say. Okay, I think we lost you again. I'm so sorry for that. Um, not coming back. Okay. <clears throat> Perhaps let me go on with oh, Cornelia. Here I'm, you are. Here you are. Sorry, this is really terrible this connection. So, so in this case, um, we need to start thinking about what the safeguards are, both in the development of the AI systems, but but almost more importantly in the deployment of the AI systems. And this is this is we're also we are closer to potentially impacted um, citizens in the broadest sense. So that's. That's important, and it's as I said at my earliest comment. You know, this is this is not only how do we control the AI, but how do we in in infuse a, a thinking through the use of AI that that puts into question that result, but our own current processes that we have in place. I had recently a discussion uh, in the context of judicial judicial uh, use of AI where um, AI could be used to to look at patterns that existed in current in current uh, judgments um, and that is now prohibited for example in certain countries but we need to have this openness to think this through and we need of course the people that that will deploy them we need to to help them, be to be able to make their own decisions to not be over you know that they don't have the feeling to be overturned to give you a concrete example if you are a doctor um, that has um assist an ai system that augments his capability um to make decisions for example through better patterns of cancer um but he needs to be sure that if he 
deviates from the prediction of the model or from the prediction of the system that this does not um uh is not at worst to for example how he is um how this the doctor might might be insured so there is a lot of things we need to think through in in embedding the capabilities of ai systems in this human computing interaction it's not only control it's much more we need to really think this through um, and then last point just on the point that you asked me uh, in terms of national regulation versus uh, international regulations i think the good and this is different the good news and it's different from gdpr developments the, the discussions around ai regulations are happening at the same time globally um, and there's also a lot of global discussions um, at the OECD level, at the World Economic Forum level, the OSCE level, at G7, G20, but also within the transatlantic uh, tech council, these discussions are happening. So I find this very positive. Um, generally, from a from a in from a company perspective, you want to minimize compliance costs by adapting to 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 the standard that ensures that if you apply that standard, you're covered everywhere. And so this is like a it's an internal race to the top because it's a, a, that's how compliance works best, and you don't want to develop uh, your tools uh, for different regions in a different way. So that's eventually another good news in this in this context. Thank you, Cornelia. Uh, before I, I go to Jose, I would like to announce that we have perhaps after the next uh, question to Jose Barr, the possibility for one or two questions from the audience. So uh, be prepared. <clears throat> Jose, I wanted to ask you, um, when we come to global policy making or to the global um to the global approach to mitigating these risks of course the global digital compact which is to be drafted in the next um month uh, is um something where we could define some of the corner points cornerstones where, what would you think what would be the role of the global digital compact in this in which criteria should be there in order to mitigate these risks of human rights violations via algorithms well, thank you again. Um, so I think that as the Global Digital Compact seeks to ensure an open and free and secure digital future of Internet for all, then um, the, 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 there should be some principles on algorithm. The principles on algorithm that should be included, should um, encompass, in, um, for example, inclusiveness. So we already we 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 already talked about it, and then I'm 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 happy that my conclusion on this is is in tandem with um, the ones that my 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 the other speakers before me have have cited. For example, in inclusiveness. So uh, then uh, there should be no discrimination in the use of algorithms. Um, algorithms should be beneficial to all, regardless of gender and race. Um, and then um, this 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 should be should be included in its in its training stages in its development stages it should take inputs from a diverse background and, and then um, they can be written to have controls such that they are not bigoted or biased it, it should be made to check the bigotry and discrimination that has existed in the past so for example um let's say let's say there's a preconceived belief you know of a certain race of people having bad credit scores which is influencing the training of algorithms to be biased against all citizens of that race because of that preconceived belief. When applying for government or bank loans, then there's a problem here. So this, this, this is similar to how algorithms can be trained to ensure that more women are accepted in STEM programs. You see, it should, it should, it should ensure the safety of users and their information. So safety, safety not just from tech companies, but also from the government. And I think the 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 this should be this should be something that should be discussed in that should be included in the 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 discussions of the of the inputs that are going to be to be um, included in the global digital compact. 
So algorithms and AI put so much control in the hands of corporations and then governments. And the discussion of the GDC should include that, that of government surveillance of citizens and restriction of services. It's because it's, 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 it's ironic that the same technology that is meant to improve quality of life can be used in spying on users and denying them of benefits that these technology have to offer as a result of fear. For example, um, the government of Nigeria spent 10 billion naira in WhatsApp surveillance technology to spy on journalists. And this resulted in several journalists being summoned to court on various charges. Also, algorithms should check and deter disinformation. Disinformation, especially gender disinformation, is, is, is a menace that the world is trying to uh, combat now. So studies in multiple countries have proven that disinformation is a tactic employed by states and non-actors, whether it is to advance geopolitical or ideological or financial interests. Coordinated and targeted campaigns leverage misogyny, patriarchy, and hate in order to silence opposition voices, erode trust in democratic processes, and also undermine democratic principles. So social media algorithms tend to push the, the most viewed content without checking if it's true. So, and then, and then this tends to magnify the impact of fake news. So because, because there are so many, and then, you know, conspiracy theory videos, for example, get a great deal of traffic than accurate and properly sourced ones. And then this is this is what uh, this is what one of the Google-owned platforms former engineer said. Her name is Guillaume Chaslow. So um, I think this principle should be included in the global digital compact. And then what can realistically be expected? Unfortunately, unfortunately, is that data is a vulnerable and vulnerable resource, and its value will only increase exponentially in time. And there's always going to be companies that would still be looking to buy some type of data from other tech companies to develop some type of algorithms, which is also one problem that is cited, that sometimes there are people who buy personal data of, of let's say, a clientele or a client base of an already existing tech company, just so that it could help feed into their development of their new algorithm. And also, there's a problem of hackers who will also steal people's personal information, such as demographics, social security numbers, and bank cards to sell on the dark net. And this is likely to persist in the future. So there should be sanctions in place to prevent the sale of private data, especially health data. And then both governments and private sectors should continue reviewing the development and use of these algorithms. If we can develop algorithms properly, then the world could be something that resembles the technological utopia that we hope to live in, where technology is, is, is far more advanced and safer and way really more easier. Now, the, the, the risks and biases of AI was, could somewhat be reduced and algorithmic technology would be safer and serve a wider portion of global citizenry. And also, it will bring together governments and tech company and civil society in achieving uh, an open and free and secure digital future for all. And when all of these sectors are involved, then it improves the checks and balances of all sectors involved in the creation and regulation of AI. So re realistically, we shouldn't expect that the risks and biases of algorithm are going to magically vanish in a short while. However, if we do develop algorithms properly, then the world can be safer regarding considering algorithmic technologies and then algorithm system. Thank you. Thank you, Ose, also for building the bridge back to the positive experts, uh, aspects of technological progress and also AI and algorithms. That's very useful and actually that's what you said, uh, our shared digital future, that's also something that uh, all of us fight for. I, I don't see any questions and comments here in the room and we have also reached uh, the end of our time. <clears throat> I see something in the chat, but I can't really read it because it's too small. And so I want to conclude this session by thanking you all for your contributions. It was a very useful discussion and I think we shed some light on, on the question of how to regulate algorithms. Thank you very much. Bye. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.